Well, I, I will talk for a minute. I'm going to talk a little bit more next week because there's so many things I want to mention today. First of all, it's Mother's Day, and I just want to wish you a happy Mother's Day and, and recognize, as we do in so many ways, that for some of us, like Elliot said, this is a great day, and for some of us, it's a really hard day. And so we want to celebrate women today. I want to remind you, if you weren't here right at the beginning of the service, because I know we don't all get here right at the beginning of service, right? Is that you? Um, that we're, we have a gift for, for women, and we also have a treat for women and everybody today. So we want to celebrate God's gift of women. And it just so happens, just so happens that um, I just got back from Israel. So I want to tell you, can I tell you a little bit about that experience? Number one, someone said to me, you look rested. That's a lie, okay? <laughs> a suntan covers up a multitude of sins, and I'm still jet lagged. I came in Wednesday night. We all got in Wednesday night, and um, I slept an hour last night. And so I was reading through my notes and praying back there because I just had to gather myself and I made a, maybe what was a huge mistake, I drank my first ever Red Bull. Um, bad, bad idea or good idea? I don't know, um, but I did it. I think Red Bull and Taco Bell are like the same thing, right? You, you enjoy it for a moment and then you regret it on the back end. Um, anyway, so, so about, about 12 days ago, our family got on a plane and it just, this, just this gift of God, we got to go to Israel together. And I want to thank you. I know so many of you were praying for us. Uh, it was a total gift of grace that we all got to go together. That was an unexpected thing that the Lord kind of provided for us. And so unbeknownst to us, I signed up to go. Uh, Pastor Gary, who was my predecessor here for 27 years, his wife, Jory, and then one of our pastor emeritus's, Ward Tannenberg, were leading the trip. And, and I, I'm going to, Liz and I are going to lead a trip in a couple of years. So we'd love to talk to you about that. We're going to start taking trips and leading trips, but it's probably better to go on a trip before you just lead a trip, especially somewhere like that. And I got to be honest with you, I have not got to go on a trip as a church leader in a long time where I wasn't in charge. And it was awesome. <laughs> it was incredible. Like the girls would be like, dad, the men would be like, dad, Liz would be like, Ryan. I'd be like, hey, guess what? It's not our responsibility. We're going to let Gary and Ward handle that, okay? So that was really fun and really neat and, and, a, and a gift to us. But to be in that place, I, I just need to tell you that I've heard this from people before, but you know, people say things like, well, I used to read the Bible kind of in black and white, and now it's in color and in 3D, and it's amazing to be there, to stand in these places that Jesus stood, to see the context, to see the land, and to feel connected to it. The word that I would use to describe what I feel coming home from those days is connected. I feel connected to myself. I'm tired, but I'm refreshed. I feel connected to God. I feel connected to the text. I feel connected to my family. And, and in a really cool way, I feel connected to all of you. Um, I had an absolute blast with Gary and Ward. Love the Gulbransons. Love Ward Tannenberg. What a guy. He's 86 years old. He didn't have his dog. If you don't, Ward, that you know he takes his dog everywhere. And he was incredible. And, and Gary and Jory were incredible. And a, I'm just so thankful for the leadership that God has put at this place for so long. And so as we continue to think about this season that we're in and we celebrate all that God is doing, I mean, Elliot mentioned it, but 300% growth in our elementary and children's ministry. Our youth ministry is like students, you're like inviting your friends and taking ownership of that ministry in ways that God is just blessing. He's meeting you. And so many of you are new here. So many of you are inviting friends. And I want to tell you that we're where we're at because of the legacy that God has set in this church. This is a church full of legacy. Legacy through Gary. Legacy through Ward. Legacy through so many of you. And I'd like to keep talking because it's Mother's Day and uh, I have a, a message to give. And, and i got to be honest with you. <laughs> I, know, I know Adam kind of kind of jumped into deep waters last week, and I think he did a really good job with that. Uh, I'm really proud of him, and I'm really, really grateful that I can be gone for three weeks and um, 
we have like the best team ever here. We just have a great team. Yeah. You, wow. Thank you. A lot of clapping this morning. I appreciate that. We really do. Um, and I, I, I kind of I got like excited about this and I, I was like at the beginning of this series, you know, we preach expositionally. So we let the text do the talking. What that means is we plan a, a study of a book of the Bible and we let kind of the Bible set the agenda. So we break up our messages according to the way that the Bible breaks itself up. Now, we could break it up in different ways, but I've been told that maybe we shouldn't spend 40 weeks on any given book of the Bible. Maybe 12 is okay or depending on the book longer. But it just so happens that we're in 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 1 through 7. So I'd like for you to turn there in your Bibles. And I want to say on the front end that there are some words in the Pacific Northwest that are going to be triggering maybe for some people. And I want to tell you that I'm not going to apologize for what the Bible says because the Bible is God's inspired, authoritative, perfect word to us. And we have to understand that our interpretation of that, though the word is perfect and authoritative, our interpretation isn't always. So we can read things through a cultural lens and misinterpret what God would have to say to us about his design for flourishing in exile. So let me read this to you. Likewise, wives, be subject to your own husbands so that even if some do not obey the word, they may be won without a word by the conduct of their wives. When they see your respectful and pure conduct, do not let your adorning be external, the braiding of hair and the putting on of gold jewelry or the clothing you wear, but let your adorning be the hidden person of the heart with the imperishable beauty of a gentle and a quiet spirit, which in God's sight is very precious. For this is how the holy women who hoped in God used to adorn themselves, by submitting to their own husbands as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord. And you are her children if you do good and do not fear anything that is frightening. Likewise, husbands, live with your wives in an understanding way, showing honor to the woman as the weaker vessel since they are heirs with you of the grace of life, so that your prayers may not be hindered. Thanks be to God for his word to us. And some of you know exactly what I'm talking about. You're like, Ryan, why would you choose this text on Mother's Day? Are you crazy? You're like walking into a landmine. Maybe, but, but listen, um, I didn't choose it. God chose it. He really did. And I want to go back to the context that's happening here in 1 Peter. Peter is talking to Christians who find themselves scattered all over the Roman world, and he addresses them as exiles. They're they're meant to plant themselves and live exactly where God has put them, but they do that knowing, I'm not at home. This This isn't my final place. My citizenship is actually in heaven. And so I think about how I live, how I steward my life in this place very differently than I would otherwise. And in the context of the household code, which Peter is addressing here in his own way, he starts with this. And and really, he's calling us to understand how to live lives that are an apologetic, right? They they give an answer to our faith. They show people evidence of the good news of Jesus and how it makes a difference in our lives, of how it's something that they would want, of how it's true. And he will call us to do that with words, but right here he's just calling believers to do that with the way that they live. He writes, Beloved, I urge you as sojourners and exiles to abstain from the passions of the flesh, which wage war against your soul. Keep your conduct among the Gentiles honorable so that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day of visitation. Keep your conduct among the Gentiles honorable so that when they speak against you as evildoers, so you're going to suffer for living as an exile, you're going you're to face the consequences of that because you don't fit in your culture. Right? You're building a culture within your culture. It's a culture of life and a country of death. He says, keep your conduct among the Gentiles honorable so that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may see your good deeds 
and glorify God on the day of visitation. So, Peter did not write a 50-page kind of uh, document of caveats to what this text, these seven verses, do not mean. But I want to tell you a few things that they don't mean before we talk about what they do mean. Uh, And this is from a commentator. He says, this text does not mean that if your husband asks you to abandon your faith in Christ, you should do so. It does not mean that if your husband asks you to sin, you should do so. It does not mean that you must always agree with him and never present a differing view. It does not mean that if he is unfaithful to you, you are left without biblical recourse. It does not mean that if he abuses you physically or abandons you through incessant verbal humiliation, you must remain quiet in the home and accept the daily cruelty of that relationship at all costs. In other words, this text is not a text subjugating women. In, other, in fact, It's a text, when we read the New Testament, it's revolutionary in its day in the way that it holds women in high esteem. Because in the first century, whether you were Jewish, whether you were Roman, if you were a woman, you had no to very little rights. I know that's like inconceivable for us to even fathom. It's craziness. And what we see is we see a subversive tone in the writings of the New Testament. They're revolutionary in their day. And what they're saying in their context to people who would hear and view these things very differently than the perspective that you and I come with, what they're saying is men and women, they're equal. And in that world, at that time, That was a revolution. That was an absolute revolution. So how is Peter saying that men and women are equal? And and what's what's he trying to say? Like, how do we think about this text for our lives? What should it mean this week? Well, I want to talk about um, how to build a healthy marriage on a simple gospel. That's the thought for today. How do you build a healthy marriage? I want you to think right now. Some of you are like, you're in middle school and high school, and you're like, I'm not married. I don't, I'm I'm not there yet. So thank you, Ryan. But this doesn't really apply to me. Actually, it does. Because you better start thinking about this now. Some of you are single, and you're like, well, um, Ryan, I'm not married yet. I want to get married. I'm I'm looking, looking to get married, or I'm preparing to get married. But I'm not married yet. So does this matter to me? Yeah, it actually matters to you a lot. Some of us have been married for a long time, and we feel like, okay, yeah, I, I kind of got this marriage thing down. I'm really good at it. And I got news for you. You're probably not that great at it. Um, how do we build a healthy marriage? What in your mind, when you think about a marriage that would be healthy, what does that look like to you? And how do you build a healthy family Peter is basically saying here that you build it on the right foundation. First, you have to start there. And the right foundation, as Peter is alluding to over and over and over and over again in this letter, is a simple gospel. A simple gospel. Okay. What's a simple gospel? Well, if you look at the teachings and the preaching of the apostles and the writers of the New Testament, there are kind of three pillars, three foundations that make the gospel what it is in a very simple way. The first is this, Jesus, who is the eternal son of God and the second person of the Trinity, was and is God's promised Messiah and king. He came to the earth as a servant in the form of a human. So Jesus is the Messiah and he's also the son of God. He's the second person of the Trinity. First pillar. Second pillar, Jesus, in his perfect life and death in our place as a perfect sacrifice for our sin, brings us salvation as we trust his work. And as we trust his work, we're justified before God and we're given all of the righteousness of Jesus. Third, because the tomb is empty, Jesus rose from the dead We live with the hope of resurrection life, both today, right now, in this age, and in the age to come. Jesus will one day return and renew all things. He will judge those who have trusted his work and those who have not. For the Christian, 
This means eternal life in a new heaven and a new earth forever with God in a resurrected body. Just like Jesus was resurrected from the grave. And for the person who has not trusted Christ, this means eternal separation from God in hell. The foundation, Peter is not saying this explicitly, but this is implicit in this household code because he mentions it just verses before and it's all over this letter. The foundation for flourishing in exile and the foundation certainly for a healthy marriage and a healthy home is a simple gospel. Now, why is that? Sounds great, Ryan. Okay, number one, Jesus is the Son of God and the Messiah. Number two, Jesus is the perfect sacrifice for sin. And number three, because he rose from the dead, we have hope now and forever. Okay, that's great. But how does that affect marriage? You realize that we're talking about marriage. Like, how does that change my home? Well, a couple thoughts. A lot of us, while this sounds good to us, in theory, it's not the way we practice theology in our house. No, 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 no. We, we like a simple gospel. We like that for ourselves. But we often don't express that for other people. We practice moralism. So really, the gospel is about what you do. And so we, we evaluate one another based on our behavior. Hey, I like my spouse. If my spouse does this, does this, does this, and does this, that is not gospel. That is moralism. I love my kids if they obey me, if they do what I say, if they dress a certain way, if they get certain grades, if they never mess up, if they, and if they don't, there are major consequences. That's not a simple gospel. Now, you got to hear me. You got to hear me. Grace, which I'm talking about without accountability, is not the gospel either. So I'm not abdicating accountability or responsibility in how we're supposed to live. But often we lead with behavior modification, not with grace in our households. We parent that way. We treat our spouse that way. And we're constantly, constantly crushing them with the expectations that we have of them to perform. And you know how I know everybody resonates with this? Because it just got really quiet in here. When we don't live this out in our houses, we create the soil for resentment so some of you came in, it's Mother's Day, you're ready, you're going to go take a picture out there and the sign says, we love you, and you're feeling good about that, and you do love them, but, but you know, you came in here with a, the undercurrent of simmering resentment toward your spouse, toward your mom, toward your dad, toward your kids. That doesn't sound healthy to me. It creates the soil for bitterness to grow. And for disillusionment, one of, the, one of the things I did at the beginning of the series was I sent uh, one of the emails and I said, if you have any questions, uh, please send in your questions. And I got a lot of questions that were great questions. I can't address all of them in the series. I'm actually going to just put a bunch of them on Instagram as well. But listen, listen, one of the questions I got was, how do we make Jesus appealing to our children how do we make Jesus something, someone our children want to follow in a world that, that is giving them messages that are so anti-gospel, so anti-Christian, so anti what scripture would teach us about God's way of flourishing? And I would say the first way that you make Jesus appealing to your kids is you create a home that's based on the foundation of a simple gospel. Because we have had a lot of people leaving the church because they're disillusioned because there's been so Many expectations placed on them. If you're single, you're saying, how does this apply to me? You need to learn and deal in the currency of grace in your relationships now. If you're a single parent, I just want you to know that God sees you. And you're wondering, how am I going to hold on? How am I going to do this? God's grace is enough for you today. 
So we need the right foundation. We need the right design. We need the right design. And the blueprint of the design, according to Peter here, is that there is a design in the way that men and women were created. God designed us a certain way so that when we function that way, our families would be healthy. We would grow. We would find joy. We would experience life and life abundant. Here's the blueprint. Men and women were created by God intentionally in his image. So gender matters. Male and female, he created them. And together, men and women reflect the image of God. If you want to understand who God is and what he's like, you need both a man and a woman. You need both, both image bearers to reflect in the ways that he created us to his likeness to the world. Men and women, as they're created in God's image, Peter is teaching something revolutionary, like I said here. They're equal, but very clearly, they're different. We were created in God's economy to bring uh, complementary uh, goodness and enhancement to one another in the context of our home and the church. And then he uses this word. And it's not a bad word, but it's a misunderstood word. He uses the word submission several times. Did you see that? Did you notice that? Anybody? Just me? Um, just wondering if you noticed that. Likewise, wives, be subject to your own husbands. And then he talks about um, the, the example of Sarah and how she uh, was submissive to her husband Abraham. And he holds her up. Is this example an ideal for women? So what does it mean? What is he talking about? And, and guys, I would love to uh, do like a 45-minute teaching on this. So just if you have questions, please come to me after the service. We can talk more. It's something that we should talk about together. Um, it is true. Uh, in, this, in the context of this passage, as Peter is encouraging submission, how is he doing it? He's encouraging it as a, an apologetic. He's telling women who have an unbelieving husband to be subject to their husbands so that by their behavior, they would win their husbands over to faith. Now, you need to know that in the first century, if a woman became a Christian, okay, a woman becomes a Christian, she becomes a follower of Jesus, it, it is extremely disruptive. It is like one of the most disruptive things if she abandons the religion of her husband. And Peter's not saying, you know what, don't be a Christian because that's the right thing to do. He's saying be a Christian, but find every way you can to honor and love and, and, and give your life to just following your husband's leadership in all the ways that are healthy. And so some commentators look at this and they're saying, well, yeah, but that's just in the context of a person who comes to faith and has an unbelieving spouse. But we know if we read other passages in the New Testament that submission is a general principle for marriage. And I also know that it's wildly misunderstood and it's wildly misapplied. Paul talks about it in Ephesians 5. He talks about headship in 1 Timothy 2. He talks about this in many of his writings, and Peter does here. So what does it mean? What does it mean, this word submission? Well, Paul says in Ephesians 5.22 that we're all supposed to submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. When you become a Christian, you lay down your agenda, you lay down your rights, and the way of the people of God is the way of humility. It's the way of service. So for everybody, we're all called to submission to one another which we should just talk about that for a while instead of what I'm talking about because that's important too and it's, it's really applicable to our church and to your relationships. But what, is, what does the Bible teach about this? Well, it teaches that a husband should submit to Christ by serving and loving his wife and his family as Jesus did the church. And the Bible teaches that the wife submits to Jesus by looking to her husband to bring spiritual leadership to the home. Now, if 
submission, like if, 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 if in the context of a marital relationship, if submission is something you have to call for, then it's always wrong. If someone has to say, you know what, you need to submit to me, then it's always the wrong application of submission. In fact, in fact, Liz and I had this conversation <laughs> this morning because I was like, hey, just look at my last draft of my note. She's at a volleyball tournament with Mim in Portland. And I said, will you just look at this for me? And she goes, well, Ryan, I don't think people, when they look at me, because she has a pretty strong personality, she goes, I don't think they, they think that I'm someone who submits to you. <laughs> and I said, I, I do. And she said, well, listen, 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 20 years of marriage, okay, our anniversary's coming up. I said, I think we live this out. And she said, you do? You, you think that about me? And I said, yes. I have never once used the word submission in 20 years of marriage to, in talking to my wife. Not one time. Not one time. Now, we've talked a lot about our brokenness. We've talked a lot about my failure to lead and to serve and my stupidity. I'm going to tell you a story in just a minute if you want to hear that. But if submission is called for, it's always wrong. Submission should always be something that both men and women do for one another in a marriage voluntarily and in the home for their children voluntarily. If a husband is wrong, it doesn't mean that a wife should blindly follow. In fact, you should probably be able to count on one hand if you've been married like I have the times that a wife has to defer to her husband in decision making. Equality and order, that's what we're talking about. Design is just order. They're not mutually exclusive in the way that God made us. Women, you should always, always, always push your husband to deeper intimacy with Jesus and levels of servant leadership. That should be where you push him. You should push him to, to love and to lean into Christ, to pray more than he does, to lead in ways that he doesn't, to serve your family in ways that he doesn't. You should call him to more. And you shouldn't be afraid to do that. You should do that all the time. And, and men... Husbands, when your wife, if she thinks about this word, when she thinks about what this concept means biblically, it should be a category that when she thinks about it, it brings her joy because of the ways that you humbly, selflessly, and lead her as a servant. You give yourself to her, and when, you, when he makes decisions, you're like, he's not thinking about himself, he's thinking about me. He's thinking about our family. He's putting himself last in these decisions because that's what it means to him to love us and to care for us. And it's a dance. It's a dance of, of us loving one another in a way that we build each other up, of, of respect being shown in the home mutually that binds us together. And it's a dance of us honoring one another in a way that protects. So like, like rubber meets the road, okay? Can I just share some of our journey with this because when we got married, I'm not going to lie to you, I was not a good husband. I'm not going to say anything about Liz, okay? I was not a good husband, okay? We were young and we didn't know what we were doing and we were trying to figure all of this out and it was hard. It was so, so hard. And, and we went into marriage with all of these idealistic notions we're not going to be like what we saw at home. None of the dysfunction that we grew up with is going to be copied in our marriage. And what I learned was, the, like the first time we fought, I learned that I would make the same facial expressions that my dad made when he scared me as a kid when, I was, when, when he was upset. When he was mad, I knew it because he, he had this like face that he made. I made the same face. I was a horrible decision maker. Like, okay, listen to this, okay? I was, I was like wildly kind of impulsive. Like I, every week I had a new dream because I'm a vision, I'm a vision driven person. And so I would just share all of my dreams at home. And like, so one week we'd be moving to England and the next week we'd be doing this. And I really didn't know where the Lord was leading us. And I was young and I wasn't always very thoughtful. And I would make decisions sometimes that I thought were okay. The, the best example of that is, okay, 
in seminary, I may have totaled Liz's car. So I'm driving and I total Liz's car. Now, at the time, it's the only car that we have because we're in seminary, we don't have much money, and we've got to get a new car. So we get the check from the insurance company and I start looking at cars. And, you know, I should have bought something practical. I should have bought something and made a good decision for the family, something that would be reliable for us. We didn't have a lot of money, maybe like a Honda, okay? Maybe like a Volvo, like an old one. What do I do? I go on Craigslist and I see a 1988 BMW 535i that's a manual transmission. And Liz and I had never driven a stick. <laughs> and when I saw the car, I just heard the Indiana Jones theme song in my head. Bum, ba -dum, bum, bum, ba -dum. I was like, I have to have this car. I would be so cool if I had this car. And I went out and I bought the car. And I was like, Liz, I didn't even talk to her about it. What an idiot, right? I was like, Liz, we're gonna, we're gonna learn how to drive a stick. And so she made it about six hours and she looked at me and she said, I am not driving this car. You will drive this car. You will drive me everywhere I need to go. And so for, so for like four, four months of our marriage, it was like I was, driving, I was driving her everywhere she went. I was her chauffeur. I was taking her places. And then finally we got another car because that wasn't tenable. So those are the kinds of things that I did. And I learned from that. I learned as I went on, as we went on, that loving my wife meant that one, I always had to think of her first and me second, and a lot of it was through pain and through mistakes. And I think if Liz were up here, she would tell you all the things that she learned about being married to me. You know, neither of us to this day have it figured out. But I think that the moment that this kind of cemented for me was in 2015. And we knew, we knew uh, we had been going through some processing in our lives and we were driving home one night and we had just met with this consultant. Our church was going through a leadership transition and she looked at me and she said, Ryan, you're going to be a senior pastor someday. But I need to live here a little bit longer. So I just need you to hurry up and wait. And if you are the kind of person who buys a 1988 BMW you think that's easy for you to do? You just kind of you just kind of operate based on like well, I'm ready, I'll do it. I said okay. And so, lo and behold, about three and a half years later, I sensed God saying it's time. I didn't say anything to Liz. I wasn't going to manipulate her. I wasn't going to push her. I wasn't going to do anything to kind of you know move her over the edge. I just waited. I prayed. I thought about it. I, I, I processed. And then I said to her conversationally, "You know what? I think this is happening." And she said, "I'm ready." And then we went into the process of looking for where God would lead us next. And it was a lot longer and harder than I thought it was going to be. And she told me very clearly, Ryan, I am not moving here. I am not moving here. I am not moving here. And I said, okay. And there were many, many churches where I would come to her and I'd be like, are you sure? This looks really cool. And she would say, Ryan, no. And what I would tell you is there is no major decision that we do not make together. There is no small decision that we do not make together. Submission does not imply that someone's in charge. What it, apply, what it implies is that God is being honored by both parties in the home and he is the center of the house. And C.S. Lewis says that when, when the Bible talks about this, he doesn't use the word uh, complementary, but he uses this phrase, it's a dance. It's a dance. And so there's, there's the foundation, uh, there's the blueprint, and then finally, there's the art of cultivation. And I, again, this is so rich, this passage. But did you notice that Peter, when he's speaking to women, he says, don't let your beauty come from outward adornment, from the braiding of your hair and from the wearing of fine gold and jewelry. Now, he's not saying, don't do your hair. He's not saying, don't worry about the way you look. He's not saying that because we're... We're physical and spiritual creatures. We're both. We have a soul and we have a body and they're all made in the image of God. They all reflect him. We're going to be resurrected with bodies. So God will call us to, to cultivate our, our bodies and our lives and to take care of ourselves. He's not saying that we should ignore those things, but he's saying cultivate inner beauty. Cultivate your heart and do that for one another. 
And then he's also calling us to deeper intimacy with God and each other. Again, so many other things I'd like to say here. But let me just read this last part and explain one phrase, and then we'll close with communion. Likewise, husbands, live with your wives in an understanding way, showing honor to the woman as the weaker vessel. Now, some people have problems with this phrase. It seems derogatory, but what is Peter saying? Well, he's speaking to vulnerable groups in this culture, right? People who could be taken advantage of, and women certainly were taken advantage of. And what he's saying to husbands in this case is, you better protect and uplift your wife because in your culture, you know, she has a weakness culturally. She's vulnerable culturally, so you better look out for her. Uh, commentators also think that he's speaking to the fact that just generally speaking, uh, men have a strength and that sometimes men use that strength to intimidate women. And he's saying in, in God's household, we will have none of that. And then he says, since they are heirs with you in the grace of life, so that your prayers may not be hindered. Now, this is really interesting. Okay, so when I first read this like years ago, I thought, well, this is really kind of weird. So he's telling men to do this so that they can have a better prayer life. Yes, I think so. I mean, how, how can you have intimacy with God when you're clearly blatantly sinning? It's kind of hard to be close to God when there's sin in your life. But on the other hand, so that your prayers, your is plural there. So is he talking just to husbands here? Or could he, could he just be talking to husbands and wives? Husbands, protect your wife, love your wife, care for your wife, so that when you pray together, you'll have deep connection and intimacy with God and one another. Because how can you if you're not treating her as you ought to? So there's a category for you. And I just wonder how many of us in our marriages pray together. So one application for this week is, if you're married or in your home, what would it look like to come to God together as a family in prayer? Tony Evans says that spiritual leadership is uh, God telling the woman to duck so that he can punch the man. <laughs> and I just want to close with that. And I want, to remind, I want to remind us that these are not truths that we can just figure out on our own. We need Jesus. We need the Holy Spirit's help. And so every week we come to the table together and we take communion to remind ourselves that this is God's work in us. This isn't our work for him. And so we come to the table in communion. We remember that Jesus gave himself in our place, that he, he died in our place, that he sacrificially poured his life out. He gave his blood, he poured his blood out so that there could be forgiveness of sins in our lives. And so on the night he was betrayed, Jesus took bread and when he had given thanks, he broke it. He said, this is my body and it's for you. And then in the same way also after supper, he took the cup and he held it up and he said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread, whenever you drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes again. And that's what we're doing right now. We'll have members of our team serving up front. We'll have members of our prayer team all around the room and up in the balcony as well. And so this is a time for us to come to the table together, to come to one another in prayer, and just to come to Jesus. Let's pray. So, Lord, we come to you now, and we just want to thank you for all that you've done. We want to thank you for your word. And I pray that even where I fumbled through it, Lord, you would make it clear to us what it means in our lives. So work now, move now. In the power of the Holy Spirit, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.